everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Aaron Tehran, um, and uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, at my very first Rust Fest. Um, I've sadly had to miss out on the previous instances for various scheduling reasons. I was curious, how many of you, uh, is this your first Rust Fest? Wow, awesome. Well, well welcome. So we'll all sort of experience this um, together. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to give a talk that starts somewhat optimistic and then gets kind of pessimistic and then gets optimistic again. Uh, and, but I, I wanna start um, with some cartoons. How many of you are familiar um, with the Coyote and Roadrunner cartoon? Okay, most of you, but not all of you. Um, so let me, let me just fill you in on how this works um, because it's, it's gonna be a sort of running metaphor for the talk. Uh, so in this cartoon, you have two characters, the coyote and the roadrunner. And uh, the principle is very simple. The coyote is uh, very hungry and is chasing the roadrunner, trying to catch it and eat it, okay? Um, but in a metaphor for life, uh, the coyote basically is never able to actually catch the road, road runner and all kinds of hijinks ensue. Um, so I'm going to use this as an extended metaphor for what we're trying to do in the Rust community um, and what we're sort of seeking after, what it means to catch it or not. Uh, and so I'm going to start with reflecting back a couple years ago on um, uh, one of the, the first roadmaps that we put out when we started uh, sort of the roadmap process and, and trying to lay out our goals for Rust each year. Uh, and we talked about, you know, we tried to frame the roadmap as uh, what is it that we're actually trying to achieve with Rust, right? I think people come to Rust from a lot of different places with a lot of different goals. I think for many people, uh, Rust is something deeply aesthetic. Um, you know, it's beautiful. They want it to be perfect. Um, for other people, there are particular features. But for the core team, uh, we tried to have uh, a vision of success that wasn't tied to any particular aesthetics or features, um, but was more in terms of adoption, Rust actually being used and, and surviving as, as a language. And we have wanted to seek that goal while staying true to our core values. And I'll, I'll be talking about that throughout the talk. Uh, so in particular, the way that we want to measure our success um, is we want to see people not only using Rust in production, but getting genuine value out of it um, in a way that, that is really unique to Rust. So that's our roadrunner. Um, we as a community have been the coyote chasing this success. And I want to start by talking about the last three years, which I sort of see as the first era of, of Rust's development, um, where we've been chasing this, uh, this roadrunner of adoption. Right, and so Rust, in some sense, really got its start back in 2015 with Rust 1.0. And this was, when I say it got its start, what I mean is that was the point where adoption became a realistic thing. Uh, because at 1.0, we stopped breaking the language every day, uh, and it became possible to actually uh, build things on top of Rust. Uh, and so that, that was a great starting point. But to reach that point where we could make promises about the language and compatibility and so on, um, we had to strip it down to its core uh, so that we could be uh, sort of confident in what we were shipping. We could be prepared to make those promises um, uh, and you know, not actually have to go through much breakage. So the process leading up to 1.0 was a lot of stripping down. Um, so that was a successful launch. Uh, but after that, we have felt the need to sort of build things back up, right? So when we stripped things down to the core, we had a, a language that we could make promises about, but not one that was necessarily especially productive to start with uh, because it had been so stripped down. And so in, in this first roadmap, one of the things that we highlighted as our major goal to drive toward adoption was improving the productivity of Rust. Um, and in particular, with 1.0, it was clear that Rust was a language for writing fast programs and for writing reliable programs, um, but we wanted to make productivity a sort of another key pillar. Um, now, if you've been following the development closely, uh, you might know that this goal of 2017 was a little bit optimistic. Um, and in 2018, we set out another roadmap 
which is essentially you know, promising to ship all of the things that, uh, that we worked on in 2017. And so that, this is all coming together in uh, a new version of Rust, which probably most of you have heard about, Rust 2018, uh, which is trying to bring together basically all the work that we've done since 1.0 um, and, and put it out into the world as a clear milestone in the development of Rust. So, so this is great. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more detail about what all these pieces mean. Um, but suffice it to say that we have been working really hard since 1.0 to do everything we can uh, to spur adoption of Rust, to make Rust an appealing language, a useful language for people to use. So let's pause for a moment and actually look at what we've achieved because it is tremendous. So Rust 2018 uh, is going to be released in just a couple weeks um, on December 6th. Uh, and it has a whole boatload of great stuff. So on the language side, um, how many of you have heard of non-lexical lifetimes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that, that will be shipping along with many other um, improvements to the core ownership system. Um, there is also the, the module system revamp, which I think was a great example of our community coming together and working through a huge design space, working through contentious issues, and winding up with something that pretty much everybody seems happy with. Um, there are a number of other language features, but also a lot of great documentation changes, a brand new uh, primary book that's Turple is the Rust programming language, um, as well as a number of new books this year that are focused on particular application domains for Rust, like embedded uh, command line uh, applications and WebAssembly. And then in addition to that, um, the tooling has gotten a lot better. We have incremental compilation. Um, we have much improved IDE support. Rust format is going to be reaching 1.0. The ecosystem has been growing. And uh, in the next week, we'll be releasing uh, our completely revamped website. Right. So if you look at all of these things, uh, you can see that as a community, we've been putting in a ton of work to, to make Rust um, an adoptable language. And it's been paying off. So I collected just a couple of posts from social media from the last month, OK? And uh, this is just a selection. And I see these kinds of posts fly by all the time. Um, so this one is a tweet from somebody on the Firefox team. Um, probably most of you know that Mozilla's Firefox uh, now uses quite a bit of Rust. But perhaps even more interesting, if you look at the last year of development, most new code added to the code base is in Rust. Um, a very, very little C++ code was added over this last year. So it, it hasn't been just um, particular modules getting ported over, but actually a, a whole change in the mentality uh, of adopting Rust within Firefox, which is very exciting. But we're also seeing Rust pop up in all kinds of other application areas. Um, so there you know, are announcements of uh, software like Discord using Rust to um, uh, power some of their uh, networking along with game SDKs. And um, this tweet on the bottom is about uh, another new game studio. There have been multiple going all in on Rust. And then we even have a um, hiring announcement from Zipcar, the car sharing service, uh, saying that they're using Rust in a pretty fundamental way. So uh, let's give ourselves a round of applause. This is awesome. <laughs> So uh, adoption is definitely happening. It's picking up steam. It's really exciting. Um, you know, I, I can feel a shift, um, especially this year. And there's one other angle on adoption that uh, we like to keep track of that's, that's really important, um, which has to do with the, the Crates.io ecosystem and basically the open source world of Rust. So there's an interesting paper called Empirical Analysis of Programming Language Adoption. And uh, this paper did extensive surveys and, and other studies to figure out what makes organizations decide uh, to use one language versus another. And it turns out that the top factor is the strength of the open source ecosystem around a language. So this is, I think, a leading indicator of language adoption. So it's something we need to pay a lot of attention to. And we see lots of good news here, too. Uh, so here's a graph of the uh, download count per day uh, from Crates.io over the last few years um, since its inception. Uh, things are trending in a positive direction. This is very good. 
Um, another of my favorite stats is you can query GitHub for uh, PR count by language over time. This is year to date in 2018. And uh, these are the top 15 languages uh, used in, in GitHub. Rust is the 15th one. Um, so I mean, it, on, on the one hand, it's kind of sad to be at the bottom of this chart. But on the other hand, we're in pretty amazing company. Uh, everything else on this list is a major, major language that you know, everybody is aware of. Um, and notice, in particular, we're neck and neck with uh, Scala and Swift. And if you look at the trend lines, um, we, I, I suspect in 2019 we will surpass Scala and you know, uh, perhaps Swift as well. And just to give you some sense, below Rust here are several other really major languages. Right? So I think we have a lot of good indication that the open source ecosystem for Rust is healthy and continuing to grow. And if the, this paper I was mentioning is right, then this should lead to even more adoption of Rust in the future. So again, we owe ourselves a great round of applause. OK, so that was the optimistic part. Um, so the thing is, one of my favorite episodes of the Coyote and Roadrunner show uh, is the one in which the Coyote actually catches the Roadrunner. Uh, the problem is, the Roadrunner, through some magic, has transformed into a giant bird. So that's the Roadrunner's leg. Uh, and the Coyote is uh, sort of nonplussed, doesn't know what to do. Right? And this is basically what my talk is about. Right? I, I feel like, as of 2018, you know, we can really see the trajectory is clear with Rust, adoption is happening, everything is trending in a, in a good direction, so it feels like we're about to catch the Roadrunner. And uh, that's kind of a problem. Um, so what I want to talk about in the rest of this talk uh, are some of the dark sides to success. Basically, as we look out ahead, now, now that we've reached a certain level of adoption, um, we're going to have a whole new set of problems. The game is no longer going to be about getting Rust adopted at all. It's going to be about coping with what adoption actually means and growing as a community to, to handle those changes. Um, so I'm going to go through three overall kinds of problems uh, you know, that I expect to arise. This isn't comprehensive, but these are some of the things that I and the core team um, have been thinking about. So the first one, um, perhaps the most obvious one, is as we gain adoption, we are bringing a whole new set of stakeholders into the Rust world, into the Rust community, which sounds great. Um, and in fact, it sometimes sounds really great. So I've had this conversation with multiple giant companies where these companies are already paying people to develop Rust itself, in some cases full time, as well as contractors, and they're still not satisfied. They also want to just throw money uh, at the Rust community. Um, which uh, seems like a great problem to have, right? <laughs> uh, so, so the thing is, um, while this, this is an amazing development, there's, there are also a lot of pitfalls around the growth of money um, and value in, in the Rust community. Uh, and this spells a lot of change for how we operate. So one of the challenges here is that it's very easy for money to become equated with power. Right, so if all these companies are pouring megabucks into Rust, they might accept, expect to get something out of that. And what does that mean for us? What does it mean for the RFC process and, and the way that we develop Rust? And even this idea of, hey, we just want to give like, lots of money into some giant pool is not as simple as it might seem. Um, because if you look at the history of you know, uh, foundations and other you know, centralized organizations like this with technology, it's very typical for these foundations to run into political issues because now all of a sudden you've got this central organization that has all of this cash and that organization has to decide where the cash goes, right? And that can get very nasty very quickly. Um, and you know, one of the things that so the core team has been a little bit hesitant about going down this road. So we've tried um, you know, setting up sort of more of a matchmaking thing. Like, hey, if you, if you want to support Rust, we know some people who would love to be supported. And you can choose. We're not going to choose for you. But even that is fraught, because which people go on the list? right? I did a personal little attempt at this. And 
you know, had my set of people who I'd sort of personally vetted, and I was trying to, try to be clear, like, hey, this is just a thing I'm doing on the side. And I got lots of emails saying, why, why aren't I on the list? Can I be on the list? Um, so again, once money comes into the picture, things can get dicey. Um, and then, of course, I think it might be a bit early to ask this question, but eventually the question of enterprise rust and what that means is going to be really important for the community to focus on. So that's, that's one new challenge, a good problem to have. There's a lot of money, but money creates problems. Here's a, another set of problems, again, coming from some conversations I've had with folks. Uh, so as people are using Rust in production, and we've got all this great uh, stuff in development that I was talking about with Rust 2018 and so on, not all of it is shipping as soon as people would prefer. And so sometimes people uh, in these organizations end up using unstable Rust. And sometimes, as their projects get higher profile, management feels a little unhappy about that. right? And so then it, it comes back around um, to the core team and others, and, and they're sort of asking, what can we do? Um, how can we get this API stabilized? Right? And again, with, with strong production usage, the pressure to ship grows. Um, also, people start doing things that we'd prefer that they didn't. Uh, so uh, as, as you might know, um, or perhaps I'll let you in on a secret, um, it's possible on a stable Rust compiler to use unstable features if you pass in a magic bootstrap key, which is what we use to bootstrap the compiler. And uh, in fact, the initial version of this, we made it really hard for people to do this. We don't want people to do this. Um, but we have to have it for, for bootstrapping purposes. And of course, people found it and do it, right? Um, thereby sort of subverting the whole system. Uh, so again, when you go into production use, there are all kinds of new pressures. People have to slap things together and ship. And that is a change in the Rust community. As we grow adoption, these kinds of pressures are going to be more prominent. So I'm a big fan of shipping. Uh, I feel like, in fact, most of what I do in the Rust community is try to help us ship things. So that's definitely not inherently bad. But if you look at what has made Rust what it is so far, you know, we have a community that's been built largely of passionate enthusiasts and small companies. Um, there's a risk that those people are going to get drowned out by the needs of bigger and bigger companies, bigger and bigger money going into Rust. Um, and so it's a question of balance. How, how do we make sure we continue to make Rust the best it can be while supporting all of these new production users who are getting a lot of value out of it? Um, how does our consensus process, the RFC process, withstand this increasing pressure? Right. These, are, these are really hard questions. And they're good problems to have, but they are problems and things we need to be thinking about. So an, another category um, of, of problems we want to think about is uh, contributor growth. Right? So as the production usage increases, so does the open source contribution. That's fantastic. Uh, and in fact, you can see a sort of pivot point at 2018 for various reasons, the, the growth of the formal Rust team. So this is all of the different Rust teams, like language and compiler and libraries, documentation, and so on. It's really exploded. Um, and that's been very intentional. We've been trying to empower more and more people to get involved in setting the direction of Rust. Um, so this is great. Uh, but again, it brings some problems with it. So here's a quote from Brian Anderson um, made, I think, maybe a year or two ago, um, sort of talking about some of the problems that come about by this, this growth in team size. And basically, the issue is when the community grows so big, when the teams are growing so big, it's not really enough for people to just show up and start hacking on stuff. You really need management, and you need a lot of management. right? So as we grow the, the number of teams, we need to grow the number of middle managers um, who can help people find their way to make an impact on Rust. And it turns out that is really hard. Um, it, from, from where I sit, the most precious commodity in the Rust community is technical leadership. Like When it comes to engineering, if we have a clear engineering problem, we'll just give it to Alex. It'll be great. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Sorry, the whole community you know, is very capable of solving clear-cut technical problems, implementing stuff. It's amazing. Um, but we spend 
so much of our time sort of spinning our wheels trying to figure out what is it we actually want to implement. And that's where technical vision, technical leadership, and management come into play. And this is a really hard problem in part because I think for a lot of people who are doing this in their spare time, uh, it's not the most rewarding work necessarily, or it's not what you think of first. You know, it's really fun to have a side project where you're writing code and making things happen in the compiler. Um, you know, it takes kind of a special kind of person to spend their volunteer time scheduling meetings and sending emails to people and just trying to help people work together. Um, if you're one of those special people, please let me know. <laughs> we, really, we, we really need more of you. Um, and, you know, in the coming years, I think the, the core team wants to put a lot more work into supporting and guiding these growing sets of leaders, um, making it more clear what's expected and, and how to get involved. And I think one, one big change that we've been working toward and uh, really want to go all the way on is not having any individual lead more than one team or working group. Um, at the beginning, you know, I, people sometimes were leading two or three different groups and it, it basically devalues that role of, of leadership and it makes it impossible to, to actually be effective, right? But to pull that off, we need more leaders. So along with um, the growth in the number of people on the teams, if you've been paying attention to, to Rust in the last year, you may have noticed that we've spun up a seemingly endless number of working groups. Um, and in fact, the core team recently declared a moratorium <laughs> on new working groups until we can sort of figure this situation out. So the working group model, I think, has been really effective. Like the, the distinction from the teams, team versus working group is basically the teams are ultimately in charge of the technical decisions about what gets stabilized in Rust. What, what are we making promises about? Um, the working groups just do stuff. Um, and doing stuff has been really great. Um, and so we've been, we've had working, the four really important working groups this year as part of Rust 2018 uh, on uh, domains of use, some of which I mentioned earlier. So we have embedded, CLI, networking, and WebAssembly. And they have been just knocking out of, out of the park. It's been incredible. Um, but there's a lot of interest in, in making more and more of these. And that's fantastic. We want to empower people. We want to find good leaders. But as the structure of the organization grows, that creates problems too. Because now, as we get more and more of these teams, we have to figure out how to coordinate. Um, in, in other words, this growth in team count is part of an effort to decentralize and enable more people to, to get things done you know, without um, sort of blocking on central teams like the core team or whatnot. And that's good, but there are risks involved. There are risks that teams will be pulling in different directions or doing contradictory things. Um, and I, I find often if you get a team of people who are all super enthusiastic about a certain technical area, like uh, collections, for example, it's very common for that team to start proposing very esoteric stuff because they're really into collections, right? And so they're, they're just thinking about collections and not any other part of the picture. So we have to figure out how to balance that kind of drive. Like we want those experts to be doing that work, but we have to balance it with a sort of global coherence to make sure that the Rust project is fitting together well and that we're not getting too lopsided in one direction or another. Um, and part of this too is uh, the core team has continued to grow and I think we're sort of straining um, to be effective. And so in the coming years, I think we wanna restructure how the central leadership works too. Um, and I, I have ideas about that. I'm not gonna get into it in the talk, um, but if you have thoughts, I'd love to, ch to chat with you after. Okay, so those, those are problems related to contributor and team growth. And then there's one more set of problems. Uh, and these relate to using Rust in larger and larger scale programs. So, you know, as Rust initially gets adopted, obviously people are writing brand new code. That, the code bases are not that big. There's not initially such a thing as legacy Rust code. But that's changing over time. So this graph, excuse me, um, is from our 2018 survey. The blog post on the survey results should go out next week, uh, but this is a little sneak peek. So this is 
uh, a breakdown that we give every year of the size of the code, Rust code bases that uh, people are working on from the survey respondents. And what we've seen, unsurprisingly, each year is that the proportion of larger code bases is growing, right? So 20% of the survey respondents, and we had around, I think, five or 6,000, 20% um, of them say they work on code bases between 10,000 and 100,000 lines of code. That's pretty sizable. Um, and 3% work on code bases even bigger than that. So this is great, right? This is a sign that not only is Rust getting adopted, but it has a sort of lasting place in these organizations that you know, for the code bases to get this big, people are continuing to use Rust. That's awesome. But as with all of these other things, it leads to problems as well. Um, so you know, again, going back to cases where features are unstable or things have only partially shipped, et cetera, sometimes we'll hear from these big production users saying that they're doing just insane things um, to make it work. And they're under pressure to ship. This is natural. This is just what happens with software. But it's going to exert some new pressures on language design um, and you know, other aspects of the technical direction of the project. Right, so just to make this a little more concrete, you know, this is something I, I and the language team um, worry about a lot, where partly because of our consensus process and partly because of just the nature of shipping software, we often end up with these kinds of cliffs that you can fall off in the language. So for example, the impl trait feature was, has been hotly desired since well before Rust 1.0 even. And we eventually did ship a stable version of impl trait, but it only works in uh, sort of inherent um, methods or free functions. It, you can't use it inside traits. And so people get used to using this feature and it adds some expressiveness to the language, but then when they start scaling up, they hit this cliff and they, they can't use it in this one place they need it, and so they start using crazy workarounds. Um, similarly, we've had associated types since 1.0, but there are limitations around them. They can't be generic. Um, so this is also known as higher kind of types or generic associated types. Um, we have non-lexical lifetimes, which is amazing, but uh, if you've been following Nico's excellent blog series, you'll know that there are still lots of limitations around borrowing, especially across multiple functions. Right? And so there's, there's a huge list of things like this. And you know, I think part of the takeaway here, like it's, it's unsatisfying that we have these what feel like half measures sometimes, um, but in a recent Lang team meeting, uh, Boats, I think, made an excellent point, which is that uh, language design is fundamentally a fractal process, meaning that there's always going to be these kinds of gaps and cliffs. Every time you add a new feature to fill out one gap, you create more gaps, right? So to some degree, this is just something that we all have to cope with. But here's the thing. Um, we've been working really hard over the last three years to improve especially the newcomer experience to Rust, right? Reducing the learning curve, making the language more approachable so that we can start generating this adoption. And that's been a big part of what Rust 2018 is about. That's great. Uh, the problem is now that we're, we're successful with that and people are picking up Rust, they become intermediate users and then they start hitting these cliffs. And it's, it's easy to sort of see how to solve all these problems, right? Like we can add generic associated types. We can extend the borrowing system. We can add infiltrate into traits, right? We sort of know the story for all of these things. But there's a risk that by filling in all of those gaps, we also increase the complexity and learning curve of the language overall, and therefore sort of defeat our original goal of making it newcomer friendly. So one of the challenges of, you know, in the next years is going to be how do we balance between filling out these gaps uh, and you know, staying friendly to, to newcomers and you know, staying a language that you can fit in your head. Here's another preview from the survey results where uh, people were asked to rate their expertise in Rust. Um, I, I really want to know the people who are on the 10. Um, I definitely don't count myself there. Uh, 
but you know, I think this is, this is a really interesting curve um, and one that's maybe a little different from, from past years where it's kind of clumping around the middle, right? Um, so people consider themselves intermediate rest stations a lot, right? And this, this, is, this is a shift. Um, and one of the interesting things about this, um, which uh, Florian's blog post this year um, I, I thought stated really, really well and stuck with me, is in a lot of ways we don't even understand as a community how to use Rust yet. Uh, so, you know, there are, Florian's post is really beautiful talking about this, how there are patterns of using Rust or any other language that you could do at the very beginning. Like all the features were there, but nobody knew how to do them. And it takes years of exploration and building software and crazy hacks to start to identify these patterns and make them part of the culture and community. Uh, and so, you know, part of the premise of Florian's post is circa 2018, we are finally starting to understand what Rust 2015 was about. Right? We've collectively gotten enough experience. So, you know, as I said, it's, it's tempting to think that we know what all the gaps are and how to fill them, but there's risk there because we don't know Rust as well as we think we do. And if we rush to fill in all of these gaps, not only do we risk alienating newcomers and you know, raising the learning curve again, um, but we may create deeper problems in the language that we can't anticipate or rule out patterns that we haven't discovered yet. So again, there's, there's a tricky balance here. The pressure is gonna increase more and more over time to fill in these gaps as these big production users are, are hitting these problems. Um, but we also need to take our time and make sure we fully understand how to use this language that we're all developing together. So those are some of the challenges that I see ahead of us, some, some themes I'm sure that you can think of others. And I think you know, as we kick off the, the process of thinking ahead for the next three years to the next edition of Rust, let's call it Rust 2021, um, I'm not really so worried about just the pure technical pieces. Like we have a very, very technically minded community. We have a lot of excellent people. The RFC process catches all kinds of mistakes. My worries are almost all people worries. Um, how, do we, how do we grapple with this growth? Um, these are really hard challenges. They're challenges that every successful language community has faced. Um, and you know, I didn't want to go into examples here, but you can look at language communities that have stumbled on some of these challenges and that has caused all kinds of damage, right? So my challenge uh, to all of us, to our community, as we go into this planning process, is to try to take a really clear-eyed look at these challenges, um, focus not just on the technical evolution of Rust, but also the people challenges that are coming with success. And you know, going back to that uh, initial quote from the roadmap, that the core team wants Rust to be successful, but crucially, in a way that doesn't violate our core values, that stays true to, to what we're what we're about, right? It's not success at all costs. So I think a key in all of this as we grapple with these problems is to have clarity and commitment to our core values. And to me, the most core value of Rust is that it's an empowering technology. It's a technology that can take a JavaScript developer and let them write systems code, or take a grizzled C++ hacker and let them be far more ambitious with the kinds of things they do. Right? It can let you face down concurrency um, without being terrified of bugs or program your first uh, embedded device. Right? Rust is just full of possibilities and empowerment. And I think if we can stay true to that spirit as we grow, as money comes into the picture, then we'll actually fly. Thank you. Well, do you want questions or? Yeah. yeah, one or two questions. We have time for one or two questions. Anyone uh, has any question? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, just.
to thank you very much. Um, how to uh, keep track of the language and understand the language as it grows. And uh, um, it sounds to me like, and maybe you already considered this, um, a more formal approach to the language could help in that direction. So for example, Ralph's and uh, Derek's work on uh, Rust Belt uh, sound like maybe uh, helpful to keep track of understanding what the current language is and how it could evolve in a way that's safe. Uh, do we have thoughts about this and something that you're thinking about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just for those who aren't uh, aware of this work, um, so uh, this is, there, there's something called the Rust Belt Project, um, and Ralph Jung, uh, who's here today, uh, is you know, sort of, I would say, the, the lead of this project. Um, and uh, so part of its goal is to mathematically prove both the sort of safety and soundness of core Rust, but also give you the tools to verify that unsafe code uh, actually behaves safely. Right, so this is critically important um, looking at things like the standard library where we're using unsafe code um, to build up the, the basic substrate of Rust. And uh, you know, Ralph's group has um, already verified a bunch of the core pieces in the standard library and also found some bugs. Um, so this is hugely important work. And one of the things that uh, I find really exciting about it is unlike many academics, um, Ralph is on GitHub uh, and sort of is following the, the RFC process. And so, you know, even in this last year, um, if you've been following the development of things like pinning um, for async await, Ralph has been there in the thick of it, helping us have confidence in the safety of what we're doing. So I completely agree that's, that's critical for especially these extensions to the language that are more fundamental, um, that sort of risk soundness. But at the same time, a lot of the growth and features that I'm thinking about, um, I don't feel like soundness is a primary worry. Um, it's, you know, like if, if you look at something like um, higher kind of types, that's very well understood. I think we know more or less how it should fit in language. The fear is more that once you add that high powered features, you create more gaps, more, more places of interactions between those features and, and other ones. Um, so not, not to pick on uh, another language, but I'm gonna pick on another language. Uh, so I, um, back in, in grad school, I played around with Haskell a bit. Um, Haskell's a really cool language with lots of good ideas, and it has lots of um, extensions that you can turn on with all kinds of bells and whistles and new features. And my experience using this is if I turned on one of those extensions and started using one of those new features, after a while, I'd find myself running into a wall and I'd need to turn on another feature. And then I would you know, continue developing with that and then I'd run into another wall and have to turn on another feature. And that, that has left me with this visceral fear in language design that you know, if it's like the, uh, the little old lady who swallowed a fly. <laughs> um, like if you try to solve one problem by adding a feature, you're gonna create a cascade of problems. So. So that, that's sort of my core worry there. Do we have time for another question? Yes. Yeah, short one. Hi, thank you, great talk. Um, are we actively reaching out to other language communities to figure out what lessons they have learned and trying to actively apply those lessons to Rust? That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that I love about being part of the Rust community is because it's, it's gotten so big, generally people come to us. Um, so we do have contacts um, with sort of representatives from lots of other uh, language communities that participate on, on RFCs. So like we will frequently, if we're talking about something in the trait system, um, there are a couple of uh, prominent Haskell people who will be on the thread and say, well, we had this and this experience with type classes in Haskell and you know, here's a link in a paper and so on. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely try to be aware and uh, the lang within the language team also, we've tried to have a diversity of language backgrounds um, to, to draw those things in. So you know, it's definitely something we do. On the other hand, um, you know, language design is very particular. So things that are, you know, even though Haskell's type classes and Rust traits look very similar superficially, 
um, when you get down to the details, there are a lot of important differences. And so in my experience, it's often been less useful than you might hope to try to port um, experiences from other languages. Does that also apply to people problems as well? Uh, say more. So some of the, most of the issues you talked about weren't language design issues at all. Mm -hmm. um, presumably uh, other language communities have dealt with these things as I well. See. That is a very interesting question. Um, and yeah, I've definitely had conversations with um, leaders in other communities like Martin Adursky for Scala, for example. Um, and to be honest, I think in a lot of ways, Rust is blazing its own path with the RFC process and, and the way that we do governance. Um, I don't, I, I feel like the direction of influence is largely flowing from Rust to other languages. Um, uh, which is something I'm very proud of. Yeah. All right. Thank you again for having this short session. Woo! <laughs>